David Kwong, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So you just wrote a book, published a book called Spellbound. You have an interesting background. You are a magician, uh, but you also have done some other interesting things with uh, crossword puzzles. For those who aren't familiar with your work, can you tell us a bit about your background? Sure. I am a rare hybrid of magician and puzzle maker. I find that all magic tricks are puzzles in a certain sense. So it was a perfect cross-pollination of my two passions. I, I routinely write crossword puzzles for the New York Times, uh, Games Magazine. I've had crosswords in the LA Times, Wall Street Journal. And my magic show is a fun, cerebral, nerdy, brainy magic show where I, I test the audience to try to figure out the answers to all the puzzles. So what came first, the crossword puzzle interest or the, the magic interest? They were both childhood hobbies. Magic came first. I was about seven years old when I saw my first magician and, and knew that I had to follow that path. But I started playing Scrabble competitively as a teenager and then started solving the crossword puzzle every day and then making crossword puzzles when I was in college. I mean, that's amazing. I think of most kids, they go through a magic phase. I went through a magic phase. Uh, I, w I came of age when like David Copperfield was doing his big, you know, making the Statue of Liberty disappear, levitating. I was like, that's what I'm going to do. I'd have my mom take me to the library every week to check out every single magic book, but it didn't stick with me. Why, why do you think it stuck with you? Every kid definitely has a magic phase. You're not alone on that. And every kid gets his first magic set. I think it stuck with me. There was some innate desire to be on the other side of the curtain and know how things are done. When I was seven years old, I saw a magician performing at a pumpkin patch in upstate New York. I'm from Rochester, New York. And I'll never forget this. The magician took a little red sponge ball. He put it in my hand. He picked up a second one. He made it disappear. And when I opened my hand, I had two. And many magicians say that this is one of the greatest tricks ever invented, the, the sponge ball trick. It's, it packs such a punch, right? But then there was this moment that I will never forget, which is that he took a little red sponge ball and he put it in my father's hand and then he picked up a second one, made it disappear. And when my father opened his hand, he had two. And my father is a biochemist. He is this omniscient figure that knows everything about the world, especially to a seven-year-old kid. And when the scientist did not know how it was done, I knew at that moment that I had to pursue magic. That's awesome. So you've been able to use your, incorporate your crossword puzzles into your, your magic uh, routine. But in your book, Spellbound, you, you go in another direction. You bring your magic and your crossword work and go uh, apply it to a different realm of, of life. And that's business. It's, it's called Spellbound, The Seven Principles of Illusion to Captivate Audiences and un Unlock the Secrets of Success. Where did you get this idea of applying principles and ideas from the world of illusion to the world of business? Well, I'll first say that... 99% of magicians, most of them pretend in some way or another to have superpowers. You know, there are mind reading magicians, there are the ones that pretend they can float and levitate. It's all approach, it's all character. But there are a small number of practitioners that acknowledge upfront that magic is science and that it's sleight of hand and that it's being one step ahead or two steps ahead of everybody else. And that is my approach. Writing this book was, all, was an extension of that approach to say, look, ladies and gentlemen, I am a magician. I am going to fool you. This is all tricks. And I find that giving people a little glimpse behind the curtain is the best way for them to enjoy magic. I, I come out of Hollywood. I worked in, in Hollywood for a number of years. And I took that approach on the Now You See Me movie the uh, bank heist movie with magicians robbing banks. And we gave audiences a real taste of how a magician thinks. And I, I've done the same thing with this book. So uh, my hope is that people will have some takeaways, that they'll, they'll learn about the, the different principles of illusion, the way that a magician thinks, and how they can apply that to their own lives. And do you think that kind of magic, what you're doing, is more appealing to you know, a more modern, younger audience? Do you think that's what young people want nowadays. I'm more attracted to that than say David Copperfield doing his elaborate presentation of, I was a kid and I always wanted to fly. That was cool when I was eight, but now that I'm 35 and a little jaded, 
I, I like to be in on it, but also at the same time, I like to be fooled. Well, David Copperfield is an absolute legend, and he is the reason that most of us got into magic. But it has evolved. And modern magic today, it's, it's much different. And I think that it's evolved with the technology. If you think about what Copperfield was doing, he was making large monuments disappear, like the Statue of Liberty. And today, no magician can ever pull that off because everybody has a cell phone with a camera on it. And there's a video on the Statue of Liberty at all times. And with YouTube now, with tricks being exposed online, you can so easily Google how something is done. I think that magicians today, especially the younger ones, are not pretending to have superpowers anymore. I think there's a lot more acknowledging up front that these are tricks and that uh, magicians are simply one step ahead of everybody else. So there's a little more exposure on the methods, but people are are embracing it. The magicians are embracing that and, and putting that into their performance. And that's very much what my approach was to this book, was to embrace the principles of illusion and share a little bit of the knowledge with everybody else. You start off the book, and I thought this was interesting. You highlight several CEOs, founders, who at one point in their life were practicing magicians or at least dabbled in it as a kid. So any any one, any one successful owner, business owners that people might know of that were once uh, magicians? There are so many out there. And to name a few, Tony Shea of Zappos, Aaron Levy of Box. We also have uh, every Hollywood director that you can think of, by the way, because those art forms are so closely aligned. J.J. Abrams, Ryan Johnson, who has the next Star Wars movie coming out, the, uh, the great director of photography, Larry Fong, is a magician. Daniel Lubetsky of Kind Snacks. And a very good friend of mine, Adam Grant, who is a, uh, a real force in, in leadership and management. He, he uh, was the youngest tenured professor at Wharton Business School. Adam Grant and I, we started the Harvard Magic Club together. So I think these people, they all embrace the idea of being in command and being a step ahead of everybody else. And uh, it's, no, it's no coincidence that these are all successful people. I think there were a couple of stories in business that really had the light bulb turn on for me. And I remember reading about a Silicon Valley executive named Tristan Walker, who had this really great story about a time when he used, he didn't, he didn't realize this was a principle of magic, but, but I think it was. And he used this method to kind of be in control of his situation. And here's the story. Tristan Walker was in business school and he really wanted to work for Foursquare. And this was 2009. So he emailed incessantly the CEO of Foursquare, Dennis Crowley, saying, I, I would love to come work for you. Please, please get back to me. I'll do anything you want. And uh, finally, after the eighth email, Dennis said, okay, the next time you're in New York, we'll sit down and have coffee. And Tristan wrote back, well, I'm actually scheduled to be in New York tomorrow. And they agreed on a time and the meeting was set. And that and moments later, Tristan got online and booked his ticket, uh, a red eye to New York, to fulfill that promise of being there. And I think that's something that magicians do all the time, is that we, that's just one of the, the principles, is that we can, we'll claim something is done before it's actually done, but we know we can get there. We know we can fulfill that promise. And uh, I saw a similar trick pulled by Richard Branson. And this is on the Virgin Airlines website on how the airline got started. And he was, uh, he was younger at the time. He was trying to go to the British Virgin Islands. I think he said he had a beautiful lady waiting for him. And the flight was canceled. So he walked over to a charter company and he hired a plane. And by the way, this was before... Branson had the gazillion dollars that he has now. And he hired that plane, and then he had to fulfill that promise. So he, he borrowed a chalkboard and wrote, Virgin Airlines, $39, one way to the British Virgin Islands, and went around the airport and collected all the other passengers. And that's how he was able to, uh, to, to fulfill the promise and the cost of the airline that he just chartered. So 
that's a little glimpse, uh, and that's what inspired me to to write this book. All right, so we'll get more into the specifics of some of these principles that business owners apply that you also find in the world of magic. But I thought it was, you had an interesting vignette in your book about uh, Theodore Roosevelt and Houdini. We're big fans of Theodore Roosevelt here at AOM. Can you talk a bit about Houdini's connection with TR? I mean, why, why did... I think Houdini had a fascination with TR, but also TR was attracted or drawn to Houdini as well. What was going on there? Teddy Roosevelt is certainly the manliest man out there, and I think Houdini is a, is a close second, and it's, it's not a coincidence that they were part of the same era. I think at the time, this was, this was really the beginning of the, the, the perfect man, this sort of idealized perfect man. There's actually a great book that everyone should check out, which is called Houdini, Tarzan, and the Perfect Man by John Casson. And I took a look at that for this book. And in this era, this is where you have the, the beginning of bodybuilding and people going to Coney Island and showing off their, their sculpted bodies. And this is, this is largely why Houdini rose to such fame at this time because he exhibited this uh, idealized strong man persona. Um, and Houdini was known for and ultimately, uh, well, do you know, do you know how Houdini died? Do you have a, yeah, he had that, that bit where he had people just punch him in the gut. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And, and, and many people think that he died in the, in the water torture cell because of what's been portrayed in the movies, but that's exactly what he was doing. He was tightening his, his abdominal muscles and letting people punch him in the gut and he could take the punch. This led to his death because he wasn't prepared for a punch when he was up in Montreal and a, a couple of students uh, approached him and, and socked him right in the stomach and it, it ruptured his spleen. But <laughs> before that, of course, Houdini was uh, the manliest man out there. And he met Teddy Roosevelt, I believe for the first time, on a uh, transatlantic voyage from the UK back to New York in, in 1914. And there's a, a famous story about Houdini pulling one over on the Rough Rider himself. And on this voyage, well, it, it first starts with prep work, which is a big, which is a big, big principle in magic. And Houdini had found out from his booking agent that Roosevelt was going to be on this uh, on this cruise. So he went straight to the London Telegraph to research where Roosevelt had been. And Roosevelt was out of office this time. He had sort of become a private citizen once again. The details weren't out there. So this was information that the public was not privy to. And Houdini was able to find out that he was in South America exploring the River of Doubt. And armed with this information, he decided to perform a spirit slate routine on board the Imperator, the, the ship they were on, and he was able to read Roosevelt's mind. And basically, what the spirit slates are, are they are blank chalkboards. You show that there's nothing on, on any side of the, of the chalkboards, and when you put them together, a spirit will manifest certain words. So Houdini asked the audience to write down questions. Now, he was prepared for Roosevelt. And what he would have done, as the legend tells it, is that he would have forced this question, where were you last Christmas? He would have either slipped in his own piece of paper with that written on it, or he, he had a stooge in the audience. But just as it happens, Roosevelt asked the very question that he was hoping to get, which was, where was I last Christmas? So he was not one step ahead, but like 10 steps ahead when, when TR did that. Houdini took President Roosevelt's slip of paper, dropped it in between the spirit slates, and when he pulled it apart, it said, near the Andes, and there was a colored drawing of the map of Brazil, the exact location where uh, Roosevelt had traveled. And the next day, Roosevelt pulls Houdini aside and asks him, quote, man to man, end quote, if the spirits had really manifested these words on the slates. And, and Houdini said, no, Colonel, it was just hocus pocus. So that's what the, the legend holds. And I, I think it's a great encounter between the two of them. That is. This story of Houdini and Roosevelt leads perfectly to my next question about prep. And in magic, it's called uh, loading up. So what does it mean to load up in the world of magic? 
I, mean, I guess it's prep work, but what I'd like to hear like what, what that involves and how can a business apply that concept to what they're doing? Loading up is a term that I sort of commandeered and, and, and transformed into a principle. We as magicians will often say, I was so loaded up when I walked into that bar or when I arrived at the party, I was loaded up. And what that refers to are the hidden strings that we might have running up and down our sleeves or the, uh, our, our pockets stuffed with various devices. What can I really say here? You know, magnets and maybe a fake thumb or two, these different things that we have to make ourselves appear superhuman. And this is the idea of being a step ahead or three of everybody else. So I took that phrase loaded up and I turned it into an active verb, loading up. And this is referring to doing all the heavy lifting ahead of time and then appearing magical in the moment. How can businesses, quote unquote, load up? I mean, why is it important for businesses to do all the the heavy lifting behind the scenes and just make it appear flawless and easy when they actually deliver to their customer? Well, think about this example. If you are working on a project and your boss says, I need this delivered by a certain date, you can have already done all the heavy lifting because you've anticipated that this uh, assignment is coming. And maybe you work late nights, maybe you do it over the weekend and you deliver it ahead of schedule. But then you have a choice. You can appear superhuman as if you just instantly fulfilled the task or you can reveal your method. You can reveal that you anticipated that this assignment was coming and you can reveal exactly how you pulled it off with the extra behind the scenes work. And that's kind of the choice actually that magicians make, right? Is do do you appear to be the David Copperfield, David Blaine sort? Or do you kind of expose and get credit for your cleverness and get credit for all the the, the hard work and smarts that went into something? So I mean, I guess the question is like, how do you decide which one, like which approach is best? I'm not sure. <laughs> that's a that's a personal choice that, that people make. Uh, I I I lobby for the the second choice, which has been my approach through magic. When I perform and I do my uh, feats with with Scrabble words or crossword puzzles or or math, I'm revealing to the audience that I've spent thousands and thousands of hours memorizing these things. And I think that I get a a credit for it in that way. And and I, at that end of the spectrum, you kind of become super, superhuman in a different way because you're so insane as to to put in all that time. So that that's my approach, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking in the world of business, if you're an employee and your boss gives you that deadline and you you load it up, right? And you're able to just present it to him and you pass it off like, oh, it was nothing. Uh, that could backfire on you because your boss would be like, wow, this guy's awesome. I'll just throw more work at him because he, <laughs> he can do it so quickly and so easily. Yeah, you might you might get bogged down with a lot of extra work. I do think you would uh, hold the cards against your your chest for that. Yeah, you you wouldn't want to you wouldn't you wouldn't want to tip your hand uh, in that situation. So one sub-principle of being loaded up, of being prepared, is the one-ahead principle. And I'll, I'll teach you a really quick trick that you can do with the one-ahead principle. Uh, and by the way, I don't think this is the, the kind of trick that uh, the magic police is going to break down my door uh, because I'm uh, revealing. Uh, this is just a fun, silly trick that you can do. So, so try this. You, you spread the cards in front of you, but you secretly memorize the bottom card. Let's, let's say it's a three of diamonds. Now, this card is your one ahead card. You are now ahead of the audience with this card. And then you wave your hand magically over the spread of face down cards, sensing the value of another card. And you pick it up and you say, before looking at it, this is the three of diamonds. And you look at it to verify your claim and you say, yes, I'm correct. But you don't show this card to the audience. You keep it to yourself. And you are now getting the value of a new card. Let's call the queen of spades. So you're now one ahead. You continue to be one ahead with the queen of spades. And then you pick up a new card, sensing what it might be. And you say, this is the queen of spades. And you pick that one up and you look at it. And let's say it's actually the seven of hearts. But you say, yes, I'm correct. 
<laughs> and then you go for a third card. You say, I will pick up the seven of hearts, the value that you just looked at. You pick up the bottom card, your original one ahead card, which you remember was the three of diamonds. Uh, you've now caught up. The value of all three cards has been said to your audience. And your grand finale is to remind them that you predicted all of the cards. So that's a, that's a fun little trick that you can do with the one ahead principle. And there was a a banker named Lou Horwitz, who I interviewed, who used this one ahead principle in a way to change the way that entertainment financing uh, took place. And this was back in the 70s. And he, he was producing a TV show. They had paid $125,000 of their own money, the producers did this, to create the pilot. And the studio was set to pay them back upon delivery of the pilot. So what Lou Horowitz proposed was that the producers could assign the payment to his bank in exchange for a new loan. So in other words, the studio's $125,000 would put the lender one step ahead of the customer and create a risk-free loan. So in other words, they were, uh, they were financing with their own money, but they were always covered for it. And the show that he made using that method was the Mary Tyler Moore show. So there's a real example of how uh, getting a step ahead of your audience can, can produce results. Another important aspect of magic is narrative. What happens as a magician when you're doing a trick, you don't have any a story going along with it. Does the trick fall flat? Does it is it not as impressive? Why is it so important to have a story when you're going when you're performing a trick? The problem is the sad reality is that most magicians do not have story with their magic tricks, and this is why I think there is this uh, kind of. That's why there are so many birthday party magicians that don't go anywhere. The really great magicians out there imbue narrative and dramatic arc into their stories. I think David Copperfield did this the best. Copperfield's shows, they really hit that emotional core in the audience. There's swelling music and lights and, and there's images of his grandfather. And he, 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 Copperfield was a master of taking narrative and and putting it right in the hands of the audience and getting them to feel like they were a part of the show. So even on a smaller level, if you're doing a card trick for somebody, there should be a story there. You should get people to, to understand the, follow the arc of what you're doing. And unfortunately, most magicians don't take advantage of this. They just they just kind of do the trick. There's a, you know, uh, the audience might find it cool for a moment, but it doesn't stay with them, right? So in business, the same thing applies. You can provide just a quality product that's amazing, that, that works, that uh, makes people's lives better. It really doesn't stick oftentimes until you have a story that goes along with it, right? That's right. I did a lot of research talking to social scientists and uh, neurobiologists about the effects of story. And one, one scientist in particular, he, he's become a very good friend, Paul Zak, is a neuroeconomist, and he d discovered oxytocin. He, he discovered the, the hormone that has released that increases our sensitivity and our, our response to social cues that, that makes us more empathetic. And when, if you look at commercials and advertising, when these things tap into our mirror neurons, the parts of our, our brain that respond to what's going on on screen, we will, we will liken what we're seeing to our own emotional experiences and, and the message will be more effective because when you, see, when you see your action hero on screen jumping from a train, your, your palms are sweating in the audience, right? Because you are experiencing what he's experiencing. Your, your mirror neurons are firing. So when you can engage people in an emotional level, people will be more receptive to your product. Another concept for magic is this idea of controlling the frame. What is the frame in the world of magic and what are the different ways magicians, what are, how do magicians control the frame when they're performing a trick? Controlling the frame is a phrase that we magicians use to describe misdirection and our abilities to command people's attention. If you think about 
a performance. You are watching a certain area of the stage. If it's a close-up magic performance, you're watching the hands as they deal cards on the table. This is the frame. This is the proscenium of the stage through which you are viewing the trick. And uh, there's absolutely a reason why filmmaking came out of illusion uh, at the turn of the last century. And we could talk about that in a moment. This frame can be moved. So if you want to sneak something out of your pocket as a magician, you are going to move the frame up in a way because maybe you pull a coin out of the air. Everybody's attention goes up there their whole frame of viewing goes up there and you can you can sneak something out of your pocket or from behind the chair or wherever you've hidden it. Let's talk about film. How did film use this concept of controlling the frame to, to do what they do? Filmmaking really rose out of illusion. And one of the most central figures there was George Méliès, who was a magician and the the father of special effects and cinema. And he actually took over the Théâtre Robert Houdin. Robert Houdin was the great French magician who is considered the father of modern magic. Now, Robert Houdin was the gentleman who made magic safe as an evening performance. Think of magic before as something that was just kind of done on the streets as sort of a juggling act, right? Well, Robert Houdin, he had his audiences put on evening clothes. You put on your white tie and tails. You come to his theater, to the Théâtre Robert Houdin, and and you view uh, an evening of astonishment and illusion. And George Méliès took over that theater. So if you think about about filmmaking, it's controlling the, the, the frame through which people view illusions. And um, to go back to storytelling, I often say that a good magician, like a good filmmaker, can control where you're looking. But a great magician and a great filmmaker can control what you're feeling. And that is, that's, that's really commanding not just where your audience is looking, but the, the audience's engagement with the, with the narrative arc of the film. So any examples outside the magic world of individuals controlling the frame to um, you know, put forth the narrative so they could be successful at what they're trying to do? I think FDR is a great example of somebody who controlled the frame, controlled what his audience was taking away. I know you love Roosevelt here at the Art of Manliness. And... FDR, as we know, was burdened with polio. And at the 1924 DNC, he had to appear to his audience that he was in control, in command, because this you know, masculinity was the was an absolute requirement for, for, for higher office at this time. You could not appear weak in any way. So so he and his team and his family devised a way to to stay in command here. And basically, he was always in his chair ahead of time, so you didn't see him walking onto the stage. It was a strong oak chair to support his weight. He had braces on his legs to keep them from buckling. And then when he got up, he would lean on his son. And and aides were nearby just in case he were to topple. They could catch him quickly. Uh, Everything was sort of planned out. And when he returned And four years later, when he returned to the DNC, this time envisioning a run for the presidency, they had to further this uh, command. And he had a cane in his left hand. He would lean on his his son's right arm, which was uh, at 90 degrees to sort of be an eye beam kind of support for him. And even though he was slowly walking and sort of Uh, waddling as he would go over to the lectern, he was in control. And when he got there, the lectern was bolted into the floor, solid enough to hold his full weight. So no one was the wiser. He he spoke with uh, a very clear and powerful tenor in his voice and uh, was in control the entire time. So and that, the thing was, he was also in like an excruciating pain the entire time. Like people didn't realize that, but like as you said, he put on this air of confidence 
tilt his chin up and uh, he controlled the frame. Well, one of my favorite sections on the book that I thought was really useful and I was able to, it made me think about how I could apply it immediately was this idea of, of conjuring an out. So what is what does that mean to conjure an out in the world of magic? A magician cannot mess up his show. That's sort of the number one rule. If there's any flaw in a magic show, it tears down the entire building. I, I'm sure you've seen magic shows and the performer has been great, but if you glimpse a flash of a coin in the magician's hand, you say to your friend, he was good, but I saw this, right? So magicians have no room for error. So we always have outs built into our tricks. If something goes wrong, we are able to conjure up a different ending to the trick that you are not even aware of. So the beauty of a magician's out is it's not just a backup plan, but it's a backup plan that still puts you ahead of the audience and still makes you appear uh, amazing and, and superhuman. So, so for all of my tricks, there's always an out, if not two or three of them. What are the, some of the ways the magician might plan an out in advance? I mean, this is a, this kind of ties in with loading up, right? Like it's preparation, but even preparing for failure sometimes. That's absolutely right because the out kind of has a double meaning, which which also can mean the alternate path you can take for a trick. So you've asked the perfect question. I broke it down into two types of outs. There's the safety out, which is... Uh, a trick that might go in many different ways. It's built into the trick. And we could talk about that, uh, my favorite story about the backyard card trick in a moment. And then there's the emergency out, which I liken to the pivot in business, which is everything's completely gone wrong. You have to shift course and, and still come out fine. One of my favorite tricks you talk about in the book is this one you did I forgot who it was. Some it was some highfalutin guy that lived in the Hollywood Hills, but it involved you pretending that you were burying cards in his backyard or something like that. Well, that's the that's the end of the trick. Yes, this this is one of my favorite stories. My friend Blake Voigt and I. Blake is an amazing magician and trick builder, and Blake and I went over to a friend's house to discuss con artistry and deception and because this was a Hollywood director who was working on something like that. And um, we, we showed up to the, the house late. We were mortified that we, we couldn't find the house. We were doing tricks in the living room. And when we finished, a gentleman asked us to do one more trick. And we said, oh, we kind of just did all our best stuff, but um, we, we can try one more. Do you, have a, do you have a driveway that we could go to an outdoor space? And uh, the director said, actually, I have, a, I have a lovely backyard. Let's go out there. So we said, okay, sure, let's, let's try that instead. And we got out to the backyard, and I said to the director, name any playing card. And he said the five of hearts. And then Blake said, point anywhere in the yard that you like. And the director pointed at about 2 o'clock from where we were standing. And I had him go over to the, to the bush there that he pointed at and dig in the mulch at the base of that bush. And there he himself pulled up five of hearts. I then took out my iPad and revealed to him how we did it because this was a lesson on how you can uh, get a step ahead of people. And that video showed us burying 52 playing cards in the backyard a couple hours before the meeting. And then we buttressed this illusion with uh, what I like to call the illusion of spontaneity, which is that we then had to pretend that we weren't prepared for this at all, which is why we came to the house late on purpose, claiming we couldn't find it because we had never been there before. That's why we did not offer to do this last trick. We waited for the director to ask us to do another one. And, and we said, oh, we don't really have anything else, but we can try something. Uh, and then we also offered to do the trick at that point in the driveway. And we let him upgrade us to the backyard. So there's so much going on here. There's another chapter in the, in the book called The Illusion of Free Choice which is where you allow people to, to believe that they're in control of the entire trick, but you've, you've planned everything out. There's the illusion of spontaneity, which I mentioned. And then there's having all these different outs, all these different roads that you could go down to finish the trick. And then there's a little bit of a, a story device that we used as well. So if you actually, when you read the book, this is chapter three about narrative, you'll find out at the end of that chapter 
that everything I just told you was part of a scripted story and that we were actually pulling something else off at the same time. So it's, it's probably, my favorite, uh, probably my favorite trick that I've ever done, and it's certainly my favorite trick in the book. So let's talk about this, applying this, the conjuring it out to the world of business. Any examples from there? I mean, you mentioned pivoting, but can businesses also plan for safety outs in their business plan? So if something doesn't go according to plan, they can just immediately do something else? Absolutely. I think having multiple outs, multiple uh, roads that you can go down is essential for for hitting that target and getting to the destination that you want to get to. So think about this. If you're pitching an idea to a room, you can iterate, which is sort of the modern term for quick pivoting, based on their responses. You could have five different presentations to go. They're ready on your computer, and you call up the one that's, that's needed based on their responses. It's like going into an interview, and based on your interviewer's responses to what you've said, you have five different versions of your resume in your in your portfolio. And you take out the one that that that's most applicable to what the conversation has been. So it's just, again, it's it's all about being prepared and a step ahead and then applying it at the right time. So we talked about safety outs, basically it's having multiple plans um, in place. And depending on the situation, the circumstances, you can roll out a different plan. That's the safety out and applying that into the business. Let's talk a bit about the, the pivot out. There's the emergency out when everything's gone wrong and you need to pivot. How can you get out of that situation? I think one of my favorite examples from the world of business involves uh, Stuart Butterfield, who is an avid puzzler and gamer, as I understand. And he created something called Game Never Ending. Now, this was a massive uh, online multiplayer game where you walk around a, in a world and you interact with people. And it was, it was not uh, performing. Uh, he, he, there were avid followers of, of Game Never Ending, but it wasn't, it wasn't performing in the marketplace. And he had to figure out how to pivot. And he looked at what the most robust features of the game were, and he realized that when you're chatting with people, you can very easily take an image and drop it into the, the chat box and it gets shared with everybody. And uh, Stuart realized that this was the direction that they had to take Game Never Ending, and they, uh, they turned it into Flickr. And uh, Flickr was eventually sold to Yahoo for $35 million. Uh, what's so fascinating to me about Stuart is that he's such an avid gamer that he tried it again. He tried Game Never Ending Part 2, which was, was called Glitch. And once again, it, it did not perform as he had hoped. But uh, I love his dedication to, to the gaming world. And he, he had, again, he had to look at how to pivot and what the robust features of this version of the game were and realize that it was the, the communication with others and the chatting and the, 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 um, the internal communication system. And that turned into Slack, which is now worth a gazillion dollars. So you just have to take, you have to trust to your skill set. That's a big thing for pivoting a magician uh, in a magic show. That's a big thing for pivoting in a magic show is if I have a deck of cards and I'm walking around showing sleight of hand to people, I am trusting to my skill set to, to iterate and, and respond to people's reactions and change the trick on the fly and take advantage of opportunities. I'll tell you a story, which is my favorite real-time trick that I ever did, which involved, this was probably five years ago. This is a moment that only comes around once a decade for a magician, and it's when everything just perfectly aligns. And here's what happened. I was performing for an investment bank in Philadelphia. It was the night before the, uh, the conference where I was going to be speaking. So I was just doing some sleight of hand tricks at a bar. And... Uh, I had a deck of cards, and I had slipped into a gentleman's pocket the two of clubs. Uh, I saw that he had an open pocket. It's the opposite of pickpocketing. It's called put pocketing. So I had put the two of clubs in his pocket, and I was, I was a step ahead. And if I had a second two of clubs at that point, that would have been ideal. But I didn't. This was a normal deck of cards. So I thought, 
Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a trick with the two of spades. And then as the big climax of the trick, I'm going to say, well, the two of spades has a has a sister card, the two of clubs, and I'm, I'm going to make it up here in this man's coat over there. But I didn't even get that far. This sort of obnoxious banker comes over and says, hey, uh, hey, magic trick guy, if you think you're so good, why don't you make the two of clubs appear? And in that moment, I'm thinking like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And you can't, you can't break character. You have to like slow it down. You have to maximize the effect because if you rush it, you're going to completely screw it up. You can't make it too impossible. That's a big principle here. Too impossible. If I'd snapped my fingers right away and said, look in your coat, it would have revealed, uh, people would have concluded that it was already there and it was a coincidence. You can't make it too impossible. So I had to say, okay, two of clubs, two of clubs. Well, let me see what I can do here. And I started shuffling the cards. And then I mimed with my hand that I was making this two of clubs fly through the air. And I came just close enough to the guy's jacket, but not touching it, that it made it possible. And I snapped my fingers and I said, take a look in your uh, in your left pocket there and he pulled out the the card and the obnoxious banker kind of stormed away i think <laughs> defeated but uh, it was a glorious moment for me right it was an example of pivoting using the situation that was thrown be- before you and adjusting and making it work for you that's right you have to you have to trust to your skill set to your tool set and be able to react in the moment and 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 change the outcome of the trick well david this has been a, a great conversation where can people learn more about uh, your book and your work well i'm all over the internet you can find me on twitter at david kwong i post tricks on instagram also at david kwong and i'll be speaking about the book in the next few weeks with general assembly i'll be speaking in Los Angeles on the 10th and also in New York on the 18th and all over the country at bookstores. Well, David Kwan, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. It was great. My guest today was David Kwong. His book is Spellbound. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Also, check out our show notes at aom.is slash spellbound, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.